Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Francis again at the OBI. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's about 10 o'clock now, so we could probably get started. Um, I first wanted to have a chance to introduce myself. I'm the, the manager of informatics and analytics at the Ontario Brain Institute. And um, I work with a team of, uh, of individuals here at uh, the OBI. Uh, but we also work closely with um, individuals at the, with the INDOC consortium and who will have a chance to introduce themselves, I think, as we go along through these slides. Hopefully everybody can hear as well. If there's a lot of feedback that sort of builds up over time, we may have to put um, sort of everybody on mute just so we avoid any, any sound problems. Uh, but otherwise, uh, right now it sounds, everything sounds okay, so we can leave the line open. And if you have any questions at, at, at some point, you can feel free to ask them. If we do put you, you on mute uh, because of sound problems, we'll have to wait for, for questions and at, at later after the, uh, the demo section. Uh, so our agenda today will be uh, to look at uh, really giving a bit of an intro on, um, and, and sort of update on, on brain code. Uh, we'll then be looking at uh, uh, really diving into more detail into the, uh, the actual tools and the platform itself, the brain code platform, including uh, the data, data capture tools, the subject registry, uh, as well as the integration and dashboard uh, capabilities of the platform. Uh, we'll then uh, jump into talking a little bit more about the, the services and the support that we, that we provide to the programs uh, for informatics and for their data management. Um, as well as, as uh, some of the, uh, the, the items that the programs should think about when they're planning moving forward in terms of, uh, of capturing their data and managing their data uh, for informatics. And at the end, um, we'll, we'll then jump into a, 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 a well, actually, sorry, before we, we, we reach the end, we'll also cover a few of the highlights from the, the survey results uh, that we collected over the last few weeks. Um, and then at the end, we'll have the really open uh, Q&A session. So thanks, everybody, and I think we're good to get started. So I'll start right away with uh, the next slide, and hopefully everybody can see this. So the, the first slide here is really we want to emphasize sort of the, the objectives of, uh, of, of OBI's Brain Code Initiative and how really for us it's, it's important uh, that we really provide the best support for the research program. Really our, our goal, our, our main goal, is really to support the research program uh, through uh, excellence in, in data management and in using advanced technologies such as brain code and the, the various tools that compose brain code to support the research program. Um, we're also another important objective for, for us at OBI from the perspective of informatics is enabling data sharing and ensuring that we do maximize the value of the data being collected through the program uh, through effective uh, data sharing. And so we have put in place a platform that really ena enables this. Uh, and it's not just about technology, it's also about governance, uh, as you might guess, and the importance of establishing the right contracts, using informed consent forms, and, and maximizing really the privacy and security of data on the platform. Uh, last but not least is the other important, for sh important uh, component for sharing is really establishing standards so that we do maximize the value of this data uh, going forward. Finally, the last uh, point that we want to emphasize here is really the enabling of, of technology uh, through really the opportunity to innovate in terms of, of developing new tools for data management, for data analytics, uh, and also data security and privacy. And we really see brain code as being a, a really big opportunity from this, from this perspective and something that can really help the programs and, and support research by um, inviting collaborators from both academia but also from industry to work with you and, and help develop new technologies and new methods to improve research. Overall, we want to talk also about the benefits of informatics. Uh, really, the first point here is really about how electronic data capture can really be beneficial overall for, for research um, and really can, can help things like reducing data management workload uh, by implementing uh, convenient tools like data capture tools uh, that allow the uh, you know, sort of more seamless management of data, making sure the data is organized properly and uh, has, you know, enables more immediate access to the, to the investigators to clean and uh, Illustrated data. It also facilitates uh, participation in studies. So we have tools like patient reported outcomes that are electronic uh, forms that can be shared with participants so that they can fill, fill these out either in the clinic uh, or even at home in, in some circumstances. The other important, important benefit that Informatics provides is really on the standard side. So we've worked hard at OBI to implement standards and we do have uh, currently a number of standards in the, on the clinical side. 
um, that, we, uh, that we define as common data elements that are being um, well adopted through the program. And we really think this is going to be beneficial to everybody uh, moving forward. Uh, it really increases the, uh, the opportunity to, to have uh, uh, data of high quality in the sense that investigators now have a chance to uh, adopt common standards and collaborate and work together uh, in case they want to adopt these standards, in case they want to refine how they're, they're implementing them and improve their, their, their adoption and use. And ultimately, it'll increase the, the utility of the data in, in the sense that it'll enable um, collaborators to share common data elements and share results out of their, their cohorts and their populations to really increase the opportunity for collaborations and, and sharing as well. A third point here is really the, the benefit that Informatics provides from the perspective of analytics. And really, by having a, a robust Informatics platform with the right tools and the right computing capacity, you can really simplify, in a way, uh, the, the process for, for scientific discovery. And we've been working hard on, on brain code in, in developing these, these tools, including uh, pipelines for, for data uh, processing, as well as a workspace for data analytics. And we'll jump into that a little bit later. And the other point here is also providing capacity on the compute, in the compute resources. Uh, so really having the, the, the extensive uh, computing capacity that we do have uh, provided to us through the Center for Advanced Computing, formerly the HPCVL at, in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, really making the, these resources available to, to the researchers throughout the program. And the last point here is really how Informatics enables uh, data sharing and really supports the, the opportunity to enrich data sets by sharing data uh, with other collaborators, uh, either directly or even through federation and linking. It facilitates validation in terms of being able to uh, essentially look at what the results are from collaborators and supporting them in terms of refining their, their research process or their analytical process and essentially support a, a greater form of validation of the, of the data being collected or of the methods being used. Also enabling the reduction of redundancies uh, in terms of re either reducing the, uh, the number of, of repeated sort of studies, um, but in, in another way we could also improve the, the, the ability to, to, uh, to replicate studies when those uh, need to be replicated and, and, and tested for further validation. Finally, sharing insights. We really think that data sharing will, will really increase this, this opportunity for sharing insights and, um, and essentially driving the, uh, the, the field forward in, in terms of, of discovery in neuroscience. And this is done not only from the perspective of sharing the data itself, but also in sharing results and, and the analytical methods that are being developed uh, in your field. The next point here uh, with this slide is, is really to emphasize the richness of the network that we're that we're um, really affording through the uh, the, the OBI inter integrated discovery programs, we really have this fantastic opportunity uh, through the five big uh, integrated discovery programs to collaborate and share data amongst these programs. What we want to do with BrainCode at, at OBI is really build a platform that enables the, uh, the this collaboration process to really come to fruition. It's really where the, the sort of the rubber hits the road. How do we actually implement the right platform and put in the right tools and work with every, every investigator and researcher and, and collaborator to ensure that we can maximize uh, the value of the data but also maximize really the research outcomes from each of your studies and the research programs as, as a whole. What this leads to is really a, a really amazing opportunity, we think, from the perspective of, of research and science. Uh, when we look at the, the individual programs, uh, whether you look at a program as, as on itself and that this program exploring multiple platforms, including genomic platform, proteomic platform, metabolic platforms, but also the, the, at, the, at the phenotype level with, with, um, with various um, clinical scales or, or cognitive uh, scales, et cetera. So the idea is really to, to start looking at, at the opportunities that we have at exploring the um, data sets and the, the, the correlations and the mechanisms that, that span across these platforms. But also now we have the opportunity because of the fact that we're looking at programs that cover multiple disorders, but also across these programs with various disorders, we have the opportunity to really start looking at, at mechanisms across, across diseases and across uh, uh, brain, brain conditions. 
So this is really um, a unique opportunity that we hope the Brainco platform will be able to, to support and maximize uh, over time. We also want to get, in, uh, get an opportunity to share with everybody a, a bit of um, an update and you know, get a, a better sense of really what's at the heart of Brain Code. Who, who are the individuals behind this and what is actually made available today on, on the platform. So really at the heart, on the top left, you'll see the, the, the list of really all the, the institutions that are working together to build a platform and provide the support for all the research programs. So we have OBI, uh, that's, that's obviously at the, at the heart of this from the, from the administrative and planning and governance process. But we also work closely with uh, the AIMDOC consortium, which is composed of, of these four other groups around here, um, including the, the, the AIMDOC research team. Uh, we have the, the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest that really helps on the imaging side and developing uh, uh, tools for, for, for data processing. We have the Center for Advanced Computing. That's really our, our, the core center for storing uh, all of our research data and helping uh, establish the, the, right, uh, the right platform for, for data analysis and, and, um, and federation and sharing as well as the, Center for the, sorry, the Electronic Health Information Laboratory in, in Ottawa that help us develop the right tools for, for data security and privacy, including encryption technology and data linking technology. Uh, finally, at the bottom right here, you know, in, in terms of those, in those um, icons, you see Orion, which is really the backbone in terms of network infrastructure that enables us to connect to all the, the various hospitals and universities at a very high bandwidth, enabling uh, secure but also high-speed data transfers. So on the top right, you see the computing capacity that we have with the platform. So we have over 600 terabytes of storage available. The grid computing uh, is also a, a, a core capacity that we have on the platform with over 570 cores that are available for this. Overall, when we look at all the infrastructure available for brain code, we have over five teraflops um, of total compute power. As I mentioned earlier, we're connected to the Orion network, which, which affords us a, a 10 gigabit per second bandwidth for data transfers, which is uh, quite high. Um, we also have off-site encrypted backups, which is key in terms of, uh, of security and, and, and making sure that we do have the ability to, um, to, uh, to essentially back up the system if anything would, would happen um, down the line. Ultimately, the, the, the hardware that's available at the CSC is, also, is not only dedicated, but it's expandable. And we, we will be able to expand this capacity if need be, uh, moving forward as the programs grow and as the needs uh, uh, increase as well. In terms of people, so across these um, the, the five institutions that are really working together on developing and, and providing services for brain code, we have over 30 staff, including administrators in the security side. We have experts in, in, in data management and data tools on the privacy side, and finally also in, in compute, computing at the CAC. With respect to software, and we'll dive into these a little bit more, uh, more deeply with the demo, but we, we have key tools that are well established in the field uh, with respect to clinical data management like REDCap and OpenClinica, but also for imaging with XNAT, uh, as well as for molecular data management like LabKey. We also use uh, really specialized tools on brain code, which really makes the platform a bit unique in the sense that it enables us to integrate data, and this tool is uh, called InfoSphere from IBM. And finally, Spotfire, which is also a, a tool being used more and more from the, respect, from the perspective of being able to visualize data sets and, and um, provide tools for quality control, but also data monitoring, which we'll dive uh, into a little bit later. So I just want to provide also this sort of high-level overview of what the platform really is from the perspective of, of these different uh, sort of components. So really, we're looking at data management at the core. That's really the starting point for, for all the researchers. We're looking at uh, the data capture tools, uh, which provide a number of different uh, services, including um, uploading data on the platform, but also monitoring the data and curating data. A lot of these, of these, um, of these activities also take place from, from in the back end through the support that we provide with uh, OBI and NDOC. We also have the, the sharing capacity on brain code, which is key, and we have a, a very uh, sophisticated three-zone infrastructure from the perspective of the network infrastructure and the, also the governance uh, processes. We also have the data integration capacity, um, which uh, enables us to bring the data sets together, but also link with external databases. 
The standards is also a key component to this uh, because it really allows us to bring the data sets and, and start comparing uh, data across um, modalities but also across the, uh, the, the programs. And finally, we have uh, the data an analytics capacity that we're, we're building and we are at a stage right now where the, this capacity is actually available to the researchers in a, in a sort of first phase initial uh, stage. So we'll be, we'll be following up with you on, on this process and with your project managers and the, the, the committees that you, of your programs on really how to, to make these, these uh, what we call analytics workspaces available uh, to the researchers that, that, would, need, that would need this uh, to uh, essentially work on their data and analyze their data sets. So we'll now dive into uh, the demo and I'll, um, I'll leave it to, I think, we'll start actually with the, the portal. So before we jump into RedCap, I'm going to let Mojib uh, take the hand here. Hi everyone, uh, this is Moji Javadi from Indoc Research. So I'm going to go through quickly um, a little bit uh, over the uh, Brain Code portal. Uh, some of you may be familiar uh, with the portal already, but uh, a good refresher for everyone online. So the Brain Code portal has a lot of information about the different capacities within Brain Code. Uh, the governance and the privacy policies that are associated with the data that's being collected, the vision for brain code, uh, as well as all the tools and the infrastructure that you need access to. There's two components to the portal, really. There's the public-facing uh, portion that has a lot of the information for any researchers or anybody within the public that would like to find out more about brain code, as well as uh, components that are uh, requiring sign-on uh, in order to access. So I'll just quickly go over some of the public-facing uh, components, and you, you can discover these on your own uh, as well. So the front page really is just a high-level overview of the different uh, capacities that Brain Code offers, including data management, sharing the analytics, and governance that uh, Francis just spoke about. Um, up top here, you have a bunch of uh, links that will actually take you to de deeper dives into each of these topics. The getting started is a great place to, well, get started. And it uh, gives you an huh. overview of uh, how uh, Brain Code is actually set up, uh, the different components and the structure of Brain Code itself. Uh, there's basic background on data standardization here. And again, it's filled with links uh, into, again, a more detailed information about each of these components that we'll get to uh, later on in this demo. But this is a good place if you're not familiar with all the components of uh, brain code is to get started. We have a lot of researchers that are interested into incorporating certain components of the common data elements or standardizations and they want to find out more about it. This is a great place to start. Next, the FAQ is uh, the frequently asked questions that are uh, that cover a whole spectrum of information. It's not just information about the technical aspects of brain code, including data capture and data entry, what are the different types of uh, data modalities we have, but also it uh, dives into, again, standards. We talk, There's also a section on consent forms. So if you're wondering if you have a new study coming up and you have questions about the type of consent language you need to incorporate, this is a great place to, to find that information. There's also information about the security and privacy policies surrounding the data management and uh, data sharing uh, within Brain Code, uh, as well as um, questions around open access and uh, data sharing as well. And uh, finally, there's uh, information uh, on analytics and what is uh, how you can access those uh, resources. Next is the research program descriptions. We actually have descriptions for the five uh, integrated discovery programs here. And it basically gives you an overview of what the program is trying to achieve, their vision, the impact they're trying to make, and the strategy that they have utilized in order to achieve that, uh, that vision uh, that aligns with OBI's vision of uh, bettering uh, brain health. Finally, the About Brain Code page is where you really get down to the nitty gritty. These pages, once you go on Brain Code, there's four tabs that you can explore. And here is where you get the most detailed information about uh, the platform itself. 
The About Brain Code actually goes into details about the big data opportunity that OBI is trying to capitalize on with Brain Code, and we have set up Brain Code 4. Uh, the guiding principles uh, of Brain Code that uh, Francis touched on earlier, as well as some of the infrastructure that is available uh, through this initiative. The security and privacy tabs, again, uh, provides you uh, an, first an overview of the security and privacy policies, but most importantly, if you scroll down to the page, there's actually access to the uh, privacy policies for you to download and uh, read up on uh, as you see fit. Similarly, on the governance, you can access the OBI governance policies. Um, very importantly, there's the generic consent language, and this is the consent language for brain code that allows upload of the uh, data that the IDPs are collecting onto brain code, as well as allowing uh, downstream sharing, linking, and all the different capacities that brain code uh, offers. And finally, the standards page. Uh, the standards page goes over how the different common data elements were developed for brain code that are being implemented across the five integrated recovery programs, uh, and as well as what the different scales are. Uh, and when, and also there's uh, instructions and guidelines on how you can actually implement these common data elements into your own program. The goal of making all of this uh, information publicly available is uh, allowing researchers external to OBI to begin to access the information and begin incorporating those CDEs. And we have collaborators that have already uh, began uh, doing this exact thing uh, using this information and uh, working with OBI uh, to implement some of these common data elements. And at the bottom of the page, you ha actually have the PDFs and the data dictionaries. And in fact, we provide the REDCap data dictionary that would allow you to implement uh, the uh, brain code common data elements directly onto your um, clinical database using uh, REDCap. So that's the basic components of the publicly available portal. Once you log in uh, as uh, OBI uh, and integrated discovery program users, you'll get access to a bunch of uh, new uh, or additional features. One of the features that loads, uh, the feature that loads first uh, for um, for most users will be the dashboard. We're going to go over dashboards later on uh, in uh, in the demo, so I'll move on to the other components. There's the forum where it allows the different users to actually communicate and interact with one another. There's a form section. Depending on your role, you will have access to different forms from access requests to requesting resources. There's a file repository that's being used by the different programs to share files amongst themselves and with OBI and so on. And finally, the, uh, the page that most users will use will be to access the different data capture tools. Now, what you see here is all the data capture tools that are currently supported by BrainCode. Depending on your role and your program, you will only uh, see tools that you have been granted access to on this page. Okay. So now moving on to the REDCap demo. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Vaccarino with InDoc Research. I'm going to give an overview of uh, our electronic data capture systems, uh, primarily for the clinical data capture, um, focusing on REDCap. Um, we also support Open Clinica, and these are two different systems that, depending on the needs of the program, we do those. Um, with the with the REDCap data system, I'm going to give the, the the overview is really going to be based a lot on the validation of the data that comes in. One of the, the sort of the advantages of using electronic data capture systems is that you can validate data as, enter, as, as, as it's being entered. So it really ensures that good quality data is into the system. Um, REDCap itself was developed by Vanderbilt University through funding from NIH. It's a secure web-based electronic data capture system. It allows direct data entry um, of both clinician uh, reported um, outcomes. So this would be uh, for example, uh, medical records being, being um, incorporated into the system, and also supports both Open Clinica and REDCap both support uh, patient-reported outcomes. So these would be outcomes that are, or, or surveys that are given to the patients themselves. Um, there's multi-site access. Um, it supports an array of data fields, um, including text, multiple choice, calculated fields, um, et cetera. 
Um, you can build in logic checks, auto validation, attaching documents to the uh, data to capture systems. For example, if there were certain transcripts that want to be attached to it, um, and also it allows for double data entry. Um, the access control is fully fully configurable. Um, provides an audit trail to tell you tell you who, why, and what changes were made throughout the, throughout the course of the study. Um, and also, one of the big advantages about it allows for uh, centralized data monitoring. Um, so as all the data is coming into one central area, you can have a data monitor being able to access all the data through, the, uh, through, that, through that system. And this is also, and Mojib will cover this later on, it's um, enhanced by the um, in-doc study dashboards that are created. Um, another aspect of this is it's very easy to export data uh, for analyses. The data itself can be exported in Excel, SAS, R, and also SPSS for analysis. Um, and also INDOC provides extensive training for the use of these systems um, themselves. Now if we go into the um, REDCap system itself, just a quick demo on this. We'll look at one of the um, ongoing studies, this is ONDRI, just to give you an idea of the sort of the capabilities of REDCap. And again, the focus here is really on the validation of the data that's entering into the system. Um, so this is the, the, face, the sort of the, the landing page when, when it enters into REDCap. And so we'll be discussing this as well, but there's certain access controls and, um, and permissions that are given to, uh, to the different, different research to access these different, um, different projects. Now if we go to the My Projects, when you go to the My Projects, it'll give you a list of all the projects that have been assigned to you or they have access to um, through, through access request uh, forms that are, that are uh, implemented. Because here's a number of different studies. The one we'll be looking at, again, is on reproduction. Now this is a uh, this is one of the IDPs, is Andre, and uh, if we just go to look at an example of what um, what it would look like. So you can see here it's a um, it's five different arms for the study. If we just look at an example of one of the subjects, just to see how the records would be um, would be would be recorded. For example, one of the first things you see when you do have a subject, this would be the study visit schedule, and it tells you sort of basically the protocol of the study. Um, you see the number of visits along the top here. This is the longitudinal study. So there's a screening visit baseline and so on from that, a number of follow-up visits uh, lasting at least like the three years. Um, and then all the different scales that are administered at the different times. So it gives you an idea, you know, the type of scales that are administered and when these scales are being administered. And if you look at the, 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 this, um, the study visit schedule itself, it tells you sort of the different stages of data entries that have occurred here, right? So you have icons that tell you, you know, the legend tells you whether it's incomplete, un unverified, complete, and you can see there's a number of greens that means a completed data entry, and this has also been locked. So here a study monitor can go in, validates the data, make sure that the data has been, um, they might do source data verification and so on. And once they've done that, they can lock it, and changes can only be made by a person who has permission to make those changes. And again, once the changes are being made, they would be, um, they would be logged and there'd be a, a, a record of uh, the changes that were made, when they were made, and who they're made by. If we just now go into one of the surveys, so let's go back to, we have a, uh, We have a test subject here sort of for demonstration purposes. So you can hear again with the test subject, we have the study business schedules with the different different scales that are, that are being administered. Let's go here to the demographic data. And as Mojib had mentioned, this is one of the uh, common data elements. So this form here, the, the demographic form, is administered across all the IDPs. And we have a number of different common data elements, and, and I'll demonstrate some of these, and some of these are patient-reported outcomes. We want to make sure certain data is collected in a very consistent way across all the different programs. This is really going to enhance the ability to, to link the data and look at, sort of, and look, at uh, look at things across the different diseases, across the different um, IDPs uh, for that. And you can see here that, again, it supports different types of data entry. This would be a clinician facing interface that, that would be used. So this might be obtained from the medical records or through an interview with a patient. Uh, so for example, it was administered today at uh, the scale. And, and if you make an error to say to put down date of birth that, that the person is born today, you're going to get these hard validation checks. Now this is, there's different types of validation. It would be hard and soft validation. This would be a hard validation telling you that the, patient, the, the range you entered is out of range and that you really can't proceed until this has been corrected uh, for that. So it really ensures that, again, that there's not going to be any errors, any kind of transcription errors, or just simply typing the things in, improperly that, that, um, that the data would be captured in that way. And you can see there's a number of different things. Again, this is one of our common data elements, and this is through a consensus process where we identified certain demographic variables that would be advantageous for all the programs to collect to allow us to, um, to across different programs. And as you go, scroll down, you can see that, you know, once you're filling out these different, different aspects of it, you can save the record, and you can also lock the record. And this, again, is something that 
the special permission, it would be a monitor, it would lock the record, and then to be able to unlock the record to make any changes, would have to go through that, that, um, that specific monitor for that. Um, moving on to another one here, just to give you an idea of, again, the basic, basic validation checks that we can done here. Here we have the vital signs. And here again, you can see that all the fields are mandatory. So, so, and this can be set whether you want the fields to be mandatory or not. It's always advised to have the fields being mandatory. That way, you won't have incomplete data, whether it's being transcribed or entered directly. But for example, here, if you had entered the systolic blood pressure, that perhaps was out of range, but not unusual, but something that might be out of range, and, and sort of that that there might be a question whether it is the, the proper one. And you can see when that does happen, a uh, pop-up window tells you the value you provide is outside the su suggested range but you can continue with it. So it's simply a warning telling you that, you know, this is something that's a bit outside the range. Is it, did you really meant to enter this, um, this, this, uh, this value? So again, it's a really sort of good example of a, uh, of a uh, validation check. So we have these hard validation checks and these, these softer ones. And also, there might, there's, you know, the, the person entering the data might have questions and they want to open up a uh, query. So this little, little uh, icon here would, would open up it allows you to type in, you know, the type of thing that, that you might have. So you might have, you know, the person had a blood pressure of 200. You're not sure if the medical record you obtained that was correct. So you might type something here to address that, and you assign it to a specific user. And this now opens up a ticket where you have a back and forth to allow the person to, uh, to resolve those issues uh, for that. Um, these are, again, these are examples of the uh, clinician reported outcomes or clinician entered data, again, that can be obtained from medical records or from the patient. We also have the ability to, um, to have patient-reported outcomes. So these would be outcomes that would be directly filled out by the patients themselves. It can be either done in the clinic, uh, can be done on paper and transcribed in these systems, or they can be sent a link, link through the emails that, uh, that they can actually open up and, and enter these things. So if we go to an example, here are examples the, um, are the uh, questionnaires that are administered. Right. These, again, these are the common data elements. So these are a number of different questionnaires that are assessing things like sleep, um, anxiety, depression, and comorbid psychiatric symptoms. And again, these are the ones that are assessed across all different programs. We went to, to, again, through a consensus process to identify these clinical outcomes. And here the advantage, again, it, it allows you to do certain comparisons, very interesting comparisons, maybe across diseases. You know, how does depression in, for example, Alzheimer's, we know there's a, high, there's a comorbidity of depression in Alzheimer's. How does that compare to major depressive disorder or other types of neurological diseases? So it opens up that avenue to be able to do these really interesting types of analyses for that. Um, again, when, when this is open up, this is not the interface that a patient would see, what they're given to it. If we, if we, had, if we open up a survey, you can see that it's actually a very friendly type of thing. And the goal here has always been to really replicate the paper version. You know, because, I mean, these the scales have been validated based on the paper version, so you want to make sure that the integrity of that scale is, is maintained in the electronic version. And you can see that, again, this would be something to pop up. They would either do it by survey or they can do it in the clinic, and they would record the, the, uh, the responses for that. And they, at the end of it, they would save it and move on to the next one for that. Now, just going back just to, to some other uh, functionality really related against the, again to the validation. So we discussed a little bit of validation as data is being entered into it. So making sure you're not entering erroneous data. There are certain hard validations that won't let you proceed if something's completely out of range or wouldn't be acceptable. Um, but there's also some softer ones for that. If we look at some of the other functionality for this. Okay, you can see this is uh, sort of looking at Project Homework and other, other type of functionality that's available. You can see there's export data. You can create different reports for the, these type of things. The last thing I want to touch about on was here was sort of the check data quality. Um, now, this allows you, after the data has been entered, they can actually run queries on the data themselves to identify certain things, for example, missing values. So these are standard things that come sort of basically in the box with, uh, with, uh, with REDCap. And the same thing, the, the stuff I'm discussing now also applies to Open Clinica as well. Uh, for that, so there's basic validation checks that you can you can you can do, and you can execute these, and it will query the data for missing data for outliers, and these things will be followed up to ensure that the uh, it can be very valuable during source data verification to make sure that these values are uh, indeed correct. But there's also things that can be defined by the users themselves. Um, so certain things they might be interested in, for example, inclusion criteria. You want to make sure you're not including subjects that should not be included. So you run a query on it to make sure that the age range or the inclusion criteria is within the acceptable ranges for that. For that. And you can also look at, and this would be again for a study monitor, to be able to look at different um, metrics of the resolution, of, of, resolution of, uh, of, of these open queries. So for example, here you can see that there, there were um, basically 6,844 queries that were made. Um, and you can tell you sort of the, the amount of time it takes to uh, respond to a query, in this case about 20 days. 
and uh, the average time for a query resolution, roughly a month or more than that. So it gives you some good metrics to be able to, uh, for study monitoring, to be able to query the data and really ensure the data that's gone into it and eventually is going to be used for the analyses is of high quality data and there hasn't been any errors and, and this is sort of a good way to do that. Now I'm going to leave it at that and I think we're going to move on now to the... Well, my name is Tom G, and we'll be looking at the <coughs> pardon me, the subject registry <coughs> as soon as I can get my voice back. Um, as data comes into the system, you know, you may have subjects that are, are registered with REDCap or perhaps with Open Clinica, if that's the other electronic data capture system that you're using. Um, or data may, in fact, first come into the system as imaging data, into the spread, which we'll talk about in a few moments, uh, or molecular. So in order to avoid having to um, you know, predefine a workflow that may or may not work with, with all of your various circumstances. Um, instead, system, uh, brain code is configured so the data can come into brain code in whatever order it, it becomes available. Um, the subject registry is one of the, one of the systems that helps uh, organize that information as it comes in. So as, as data comes into the system, every subject ID in the imaging system or in the molecular system or in REDCap is automatically reported to the subject registry so that there's a place where coordinators can go for a particular project, like Andrea one or Cambiner or all, all of the IDPs, uh, to look at all the IDPs that are being used in the system, regardless of where that data came from um, or where it's being stored. So, so that's the, the initial imp uh, impulse behind the subject registry is to um, track um, what the subject IDs are in the system. It also records what types of data are available for that particular subject. So whether there's imaging data, whether there's data in REDCap. Um, it helps provide for the management of the subject IDs. I'll show you that, but basically by giving a list of all the known IDs to the system. Um, and then one of the most key elements of it is in, in terms of the encryption of unique identifiers. Um, largely, it's, it's OHIP numbers that what we're configured for so that we can securely um, store only in an encrypted fashion these, in, these encrypted OHIP numbers uh, which can then be used to, to link uh, subjects together if they exist in multiple projects. So that's kind of a quick overview now to look at uh, a very brief demo of um, the subject registry itself. So it is a web-based program. Uh, it is an encrypted web-based program. As you can see, it has an encrypted uh, interface. I just have to remember one of these many, many different passwords as we're all familiar with. So uh, when you would log in, you would see the, um, the particular projects you have access to typically wouldn't be quite this lengthy um, because I'm using a, a higher level access. So we will look at a particular test project so that we don't uh, expose <coughs> any data that we should not be um, showing to a broader group. Excuse me. Um, so here's a, a test project that was initially set up for Andre. Um, so we can look at the list of subjects. So that's the subject references on the left. Um, there's the naming convention there that you're probably quite familiar with. Uh, so we have the, uh, the group, the, like Andre, the substudy 01, the site LHS, um, and then the four-digit <laughs> reference number. So uh, you can, as I mentioned before, the subject registry actually acquires subject IDs from all the subsystems, uh, like, like REDCap, like XMAT, as, as data is loaded. Um, or subjects can be created directly, um, the information can be entered directly um, through this web interface. So I'll just create a subject here so we can uh, play with it. Actually, I forget if that subject exists. Let me create another number. Um, that's a simple, in, in, at its simplest form, it's just a subject reference. So there, we've created a new subject, um, and it's simply a bare ID. But as we mentioned before, the main way that people uh, use this information is for, or use the, the system is for storing the health card numbers. So I will go back to the detailed subjects. Um, and some of you may be all too familiar with this whole process of typing in the health card numbers. So we basically click here and we have this opportunity to enter a health card number. It's a double entry system uh, to catch basic typos. So if we, of course, enter two values and they're different, it will yell at us. Um, there is also a checksum that's built into OHIP numbers, which helps to avoid single, it helps to avoid typos. So not every 10-digit random number is, a, is an acceptable health card number. But there's an internal coding check. For example, I just messed this one up. Um, 
And even if I was to enter this one properly duplicated, I will hit encrypt and it will yell at me. It fails validation. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't go to the, you know, the Ontario Ministry um, website and check, so whether it's a valid number. But what it said is this isn't the right shape. This can't possibly be a correct number. So here's a test number uh, that the ministry set up, uh, 97. So I'll, once I've typed that one incorrectly, then the encryption runs and the data is stored. So just an important note here is that th that encryption actually runs right in your browser. So if there's a, a little bit of JavaScript, a little bit of a program that runs right in the browser, does the encryption so that the actual health card number never leaves your computer, never leaves the walls of your hospital or your institution. Um, it just simply encrypts it and only the encrypted form is transferred and stored at brain code. And brain code does not hold the secret key. So it's encrypted with what's called a public key. We do not hold the decryption key. So um, you know, even in some terrible case if that data was ever exposed, it would be useless to people. They can't decrypt it. So that's how we store uh, the health card number. Uh, you'll see it just, there's a few digits here. That's actually just the beginning of the encrypted code, and you see it bears no reference or no resemblance to the number I actually just typed in. It simply shows that it's been set. Um, and a couple of final notes here. If I just look at the project details, um, we have quite fine control over how data is accessed. So I can look at the users that have access to this data, uh, access to this project, pardon me, and there's quite fine grain control here. We, we can set people up as owners, staff, and uh, analyst matchers. And each of these are different roles, um, gives them different ability to enter data, modify data, and view data. Um, so again, that just allows us to, to tune the access levels according to need. Um, and then in the back end of the system, there's uh, quite a bit of extensive integration uh, into the rest of the subsystem. So that's uh, the quick overview of the subject registry. Right, and so now we're moving on to um, spread and XNAT. It'll still be my voice for the next couple minutes, and then we'll pass it on. Um, so XNAT is the system that we use for storing imaging data, um, where imaging is somewhat loosely defined. So a lot of that imaging data is, in fact, MR images, um, or it can also be CT or PET. Um, but we also store kind of all the different forms of high dimensionality or, or dense data structures such as EEG, MEG, ECG, ocular scans, um, gait, pathology images. Um, so there's, your, your IDPs represent quite a, a, a wide swath of different data types. So many of those end up here in XNet. Um, XNet itself is actually, it's an open source uh, product, project that was created by the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, it's one of the most heavily used neuroinformatics uh, systems in the world. Um, it, it drives the Human Connectome Project, the Virtual Brain, and, and several others. Um, so it, it, it's got a good user base. It's been shown that it scales to, to large projects. Um, and then in, in this, as you see in this image, um, the system connects to many other subsystems that do a lot of processing. There is a pipeline runner program that automatically executes a, near, a number of pipelines, whether those are quality control, quality assurance, notification, um, uh, various uh, systems that run automatically. Some of those uh, can connect to the grid um, if, if, they, if the heavier lifting is required by that. There's a whole storage backup system. Everything's backed up every night. Um, quality control and notifiers. The subject registry already mentioned, so the information is already sent to there. Um, and then XNAT in, in its back end here also communicates with the federation and linkage systems, which will be talked about uh, in a few moments. So we're just going to do a uh, a brief demonstration here of the web interface um, component of XNAT and uh, show what that looks like. Okay. Again, I have to look up one of those millions of different... Who's providing technical support, but he missed a little X. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the, the this is the basic web interface that XNAT provides. Um, you have a, a collection of projects 
that would be available to you. Again, it might, it might be a, a significantly less lengthy than this one because this is an administrative interface. Um, and all of the, the imaging, all of the uh, other modalities of data that are stored in XNAT end up underneath the project. So I will pick a particular project. Again, I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick one that does not have uh, human data in it. Where's my search? Okay, I'll do it up here. So I'm going to look at a quality control project. So this is where uh, we have only phantom scans. So again, I'm not, not looking at anything we shouldn't be looking at as a group. Um, so we'll see we have three subjects here, two of which are active. So two phantoms, one's an F-burn, one's a Lego phantom. So we can choose, a, let's look at inside the F-burn subject, and we see a series of sessions. So the F-burn phantom is supposed to be scanned basically once a month. Uh, looks like they've been doing quite well here. So I'll pick, I'll pick a particular session. Um, I'll just take the first one. And you see information there about uh, when it was acquired, when it was uploaded. Here are all the specific scans that were done. We can, we can look at some of these uh, as thumbnail views. Um, the time. Phantoms are not the most exciting thumbnail. <laughs> um, we also have quality control management within the system. I don't, uh, if, I, if we were doing manual quality control, for example, on these images, uh, we have the ability to support that so that, uh, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. <coughs> okay. So, well, anyhow, I'll skip over that. We have the ability to add manual quality control so that people can go through, review all the different scans and comment on them uh, as required, whether they're acceptable or unacceptable. Um, there is also automated quality assurance pipelines that run and you, you'll see here underneath each of these MR sessions is a scan protocol quality control assessment. So this is a report that was automatically generated. Yeah, that's what I get for not for picking an old one and not picking a particular one. Um, sorry, I'll pick a particular session. Uh, yep. Everybody, there's a bit of background noise. If every, if, if everybody uh, doesn't mind just muting their phone, so that we minimize that background noise, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so that gave me a, a chance to also to look up uh, this particular instance. So we can look up this particular scan protocol assessment, and what we see here is. Um, this was an automatic pipeline that was run. It's, it's performing the F-burn quality assurance check. Uh, no, I'm sorry, clicked on the wrong section. This, uh, confusion. All right, one of the automatic root checks that runs looks at um, the scan parameters, the key scan parameters, and evaluates them according to uh, a valid range. So what we're seeing here is for this particular phantom run, for a particular scan, in this case resting state fMRI, there was a ranges that were defined for TRTE flip and a number of other parameter values. We have the actual measured value, we have the acceptable range, and then we have a notice whether it passed or not. So we can see here that the overall quality control status failed, which means that one of these scans, or perhaps more, actually failed. So that scan passed, that scan passed, those ones that didn't know that one passed, and here we go. So here we see a, a particular scan, a couple of particular scan sequences uh, where the TR values were outside of the expected limits, and so we get this notification. So this report is automatically generated. Email notification is automatically sent to the people who are, are in charge of that scanner, um, and then in a couple of moments you will see how this information is also gathered up. With it. Rather than diving into the details here, you can use these uh, high-level dashboards to visualize your quality control standards, which it proves to be even more um, even more powerful than, than having to look at the particular details on a scan basis. So that is a quick overview of, um, of XNAT interface and of some of the reporting features that are built into it. Um, you may notice that, that that's an awful lot of detail to look at if you were looking to monitor quality. Um, and so Steve Arnott's about to come and show you uh, how to visualize quality in a way that I think is, is far more powerful and effective. Thanks, Tom. So this is Steve Arnott. I'm with the uh, Spread Group, and uh, yeah, as Tom was saying, 
we have lots of details of these, uh, these imaging uploads. Um, we have nightly scripts that go through and kind of aggregate all this information, and then we can feed, uh, feed these sort of CSV files into a, a, a Spotfire uh, dashboard. Um, it's more accessible and, and quite powerful. Um, we'll go through a couple of Spotfire examples, but you'll see not only its graphic capabilities, but also its ability to uh, uh, analyze and uh, perform some analytics that's, uh, quite, that are quite useful. Um, so the first dashboard we're going to show you is a, a kind of a summary of all those F, uh, the uh, FBURN uh, phantom data that has been uploaded. Um, if I click on this cross-sectional view, uh, these are web-based. Um, web-based access, so anybody with a, a particular account can have access to these dashboards. Um, here we're showing you, so every night we have a, a, a pipeline that runs and, and creates these summary variables um, for each scan, so uh, it will extract the mean signal, signal-to-noise ratio, uh, and other uh, parameters. And then we can compare about, uh, over time, up in the top we can see these are the 13 scanners we're currently monitoring across Ontario and, in fact, Canada. We have Calgary and BC in there as well. You can see that we have 32 uploads uh, from CAMH, 23 from Hamilton, etc. Uh, if we go down, we can look at any one of these, uh, these parameters. So I can zoom in on uh, the mean ghost value across these sites. Uh, we can change the date range or the, uh, the range on the bottom. Uh, so it's quite interactive. If the scaling is too high, we can we can play with it that way. Uh, lots of filtering functions. So if you you're not interested in looking at all the scanners, you might want to just look at a couple. So here we can compare uh, two Siemens scanners, and you can see I mean, there's already differences going on in uh, between these two Siemens scanners. This is looking over time. This has collapsed over time. Uh, another powerful display is the longitudinal, so showing how those two scanners Brad. perform over time. Brad. Yeah. Sorry, is there a question? No. Okay. Uh, so you can see these two scanners. This one's uh, quite more stable in the ghosting value. Uh, this scanner had quite a, a high range, and in fact, using uh, a spot fire, you can see that it. It exceeded the three standard deviation historical uh, value here. Uh, in this case, we would go and notify the, uh, the site and uh, investigate. And actually, some changes were made to bring this down. But if you wanted to see what that particular data point was, you can actually click on it. And it has the capability of actually going right back into XNet itself as long as you have uh, access. And you can pull down and see what happened at that particular scan. Uh, including some thumbnails. So, and it, it's evident here that this, this nice uh, FBURN image has some ghosting even visible on, at, at the surface. So, um, so these are available for the phantom scans, but also human scans. Uh, we won't go into that now, but so looking at the FBURNs is an example of quality assurance of how the scanners are performing over time, but we can apply this to the functional human data that are, are uploaded to spread as well and get an idea of how the actual data quality uh, are. <coughs> Another type of dashboard that we have is um, we can feed it into, uh, this is for the program manager. So this is an upload delay dashboard um, from the Andre site. And it just indicates from when that data were acquired to when it was actually uploaded into spread and it gives the uh, program manager some kind of insight of how long this delay is going on. Ideally, we'd like to have, especially with neuroimaging data, neuroimaging platform, we want data that are uploaded soon after they're scanned so that annual QC people can take a look at those data and uh, alert the sites to any uh, potential problems, maybe bring back a subject if there, uh, there was an issue, too much motion in the T1 image, for example. So these are useful dashboards. Uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Aditi now, who's also in our group, uh, and she'll explain an, uh, a third example of a dashboard that actually gets into the analytical capability of, of, 
of spot fire. Um, hi everyone, this is Aditi. So this is an example of another dashboard, the PCA dashboard, or the Principal Component Analysis Dashboard. Um, so what this dashboard is, is the results of the Esperin QA dashboard that, you, that Steve just showed you. Um, but what we did is we uh, statistically analyzed it by doing a PCA. Um, the reason for this is to um, identify and quantify the source variance between um, data acquired at the different scanners. So this is um, an example from the Andre site. Um, the plot on the left over here is a, um, is a breakdown of all the different uh, parameters that you saw just now on the other dashboard and uh, how, they, how they relate to the variance in the data. Um, and the plot on the right um, are the, uh, the data acquired at all the different sites. And their location on this plot relates to the metrics um, on the left side. So for example, data that's lower on the plot here is more affected by, let's say, drift and percent fluctuation. Um, so this is a great tool for multi-site studies because we want to be able to quantify or define the, vari the sources of variance um, between the different scanners. Um, and if we're able to identify them and uh, hopefully compensate for them, we can make sure that all the data acquired at all the different sites are as similar uh, and comparable as possible. Um, so this is from all the sites. If you want to zoom in to, let's say, Baycrest only, or let's say you only want to look at the Siemens scans, you can do that as well. Or if you want to zoom into just Baycrest, you can do that. Um, as you can see, all the data, they're connected by uh, directional lines, which allows you to track the um, track the behavior of the scanner over time. Um, so yeah, that's, it's a, a pretty promising tool for multi-site studies. Um, Hi everyone, uh, Mojib again. I'm just going to go over the molecular data capture tool that is currently being uh, used on brain code. Uh, so we have uh, implemented and uh, launched uh, LASI as the molecular data, data management tool uh, for brain code. Uh, this is a, a new tool that has, it's an open source uh, tool that uh, has come out of the hutch and uh, it's being developed currently by some ex-Microsoft uh, folks who have developed the company around it. And in fact, this tool has become one of the uh, most sought-after tools for clinical uh, for uh, molecular data management. And it was recently announced that it will be used for the 100,000 Genome Project as their molecular data management tool. Um, it allows for very flexible um, uh, ability to capture multiple different types of molecular data. And the capture capacity allows you to not only capture the actual data file, so whether it's sequencing, microarray, proteomics data, whatever type of molecular data that you can have, it actually captures those data files, allows you to organize it and archive them, but it also allows you to capture specific metadata around your protocol, as well as capturing your protocol details. There is capacity to capture specimen lists and uh, track your specimens, so even aliquots of uh, specimens and so on. Uh, the capacity to manage different types of data extends to sequencing data, like I mentioned, as well as epigenetic data, uh, proteomics data. And how that is set up is that it allows you to create different types of assays depending on the different modalities. Since this is an open source software being used by multiple groups around the world, what's happening is that there's a very vibrant community that is developing multiple types of modules depending on the assays. And labs that use these uh, are sharing those modules. So that allows a great level of scalability uh, for brain code to accommodate multiple different types of molecular data. Not only that, within LATI itself, you can actually customize any of these assays to your liking. This allows us to actually support any of the molecular data that we have coming in through our interactions with the program. It allows us to design database, molecular databases that fit uh, the needs of the program. Uh, and another thing to mention is that LATI allows us to not only 
capture raw data that's coming in, but also has the capacity to integrate uh, with different pipelines that allows you to analyze and process uh, that raw data, and then also create databases for storage of the processed and analyzed data as well. So it gives you basically the full workflow and capacity to do that full workflow from capturing the raw data, processing it, and then storing the final results, whether it be variant calls and a sequencing, whether it's genotyping. So it allows you to be, create that, manage that entire pipeline and that entire workflow within the platform itself. And then using the tools that are already built in within uh, LASTI, you can actually create different reports and data. Beyond that, uh, there's also, uh, there's also uh, stock visualization features that I'll show you in the demo that can also be utilized to actually have quick visualizations of your data right there uh, within LACI itself. Additionally, it allows for a great level of collaboration to be uh, implemented within the platform. There's a fine granular uh, sharing scheme, so it will allow you to have different roles within the system that uh, allows for different uh, processing or access to different data. Uh, it also, not only does Latke have capacity to, um, has its own processing pipelines uh, that could be implemented, it also integrates with other, other uh, platforms such as Galaxy or different sequencing uh, processing uh, pipelines that you can bring into LabCode to allow you to process and analyze your data. It gives you great analytical capacity right there within uh, the uh, platform that you're storing your data uh, in and allows for a great depth of uh, analysis to occur. Okay, so uh, just to go over, I'm going to uh, look at a couple of test projects to show you uh, exactly what LabKey is uh, capable of. Uh, there's, like I mentioned, there's customizable data uh, study structures, uh, allows the upload of data. You can also transform the data. Depending on your data types, as you're familiar with molecular data, these are very large data sets. So uh, capacity to be able to transform the data is critical, especially when you're sharing it within your larger study. Some people may not be necessarily uh, molecular uh, subject matter experts, but they require certain components of that molecular data for their analyses. It also allows you to integrate across uh, different assay types, and I'll uh, give you an example of that. So, you know, merging your uh, genomic study with your proteomic study and sort of pulling an integrated data set can be done, uh, as well as specimen um, uh, management. Sure, it's good. So uh, to give you an example of a test project that we're, we're working on uh, and show you the different uh, capacities that uh, we see um, within uh, the uh, project is uh, one of the IDPs that we're working with. Uh, and they basically have uh, sequencing data as well as genotyping data that they want to get uh, onto the platform. Where, and well, once you log on, uh, what uh, LabKey offers is the first thing that I'm going to go over is this study navigator. This study navigator basically allows you to track all the data that is currently available on, um, on LabKey for that study. So you can see that there we have 38 subjects with uh, uh, the genotyping as well as for the Andre seq data. Uh, there are uh, actual reports of the different types of uh, sequencing uh, calls that have been made, and then associated with that is some demographics. You can actually reach any of these data sets through the study navigator uh, itself. Additionally, uh, you have the capacity to assign different cohorts uh, to your study. So in this case, when we're talking about the uh, ARM study, 
You can see for this, this is all mock data that we've sort of implemented within uh, for um, demonstration purposes, is that you see that there is those different cohorts. And you can actually reduce your data set that you want to see depending on your cohort uh, right there. And all of these are defined based on the assay design uh, that we can implement uh, for whatever study, um, uh, whatever the study needs. All the data sets that are currently available uh, within uh, the projects will be under the clinical and assay data. Uh, and what you'll see is uh, the data sets are uh, being categorized based on the data type uh, that they are originating from. And if we go and by clicking on any of these data sets, you have access to that data set. This data set can easily be exported to uh, an Excel file uh, for uh, analysis downstream. You can also create custom views. What custom views allows you to do is actually merge data. So you notice that in this table, uh, you don't have uh, the, uh, the cohort that does these patients belong to, because that information is another set of data set in the demographics data set uh, that is not part of the genotype. But what LAPTI allows you to do is merge these data sets. So now you have uh, a brain code ID as well as the cohort all being merged in across the different data sets uh, that are available on uh, LAPTI itself. So creating these types of uh, merged data sets provides a great capacity, especially when you're talking about integrated data sets between different modalities uh, within, your, uh, within your study. And then to dive deeper, what we have is that for each of these data sets that you see, there's actually study folders that are set up for each of those data modalities. So this allows us to provide that granular control and that granular access control that we need. So for the genotyping report, the group that is doing the genotyping report will have access to this project. They're able to process their data. They're able to create new assays and uh, define different parameters that are critical to their uh, modality before linking that data set and sending it to the greater project. This allows a certain level of quality control by the subject matter expert of that uh, assay or that modality. Uh, allowing them to do the processing uh, on their own time, creating the, uh, the uh, final data set that they would like to share with the rest of the program uh, that then is linked to the main uh, study. Uh, and just to mention, so we have uh, different reports uh, that are created for, um, uh, for uh, the different assets. In this case, we are looking at uh, some sequencing data, and there's different reports that are created, and the processing has been done on this data by the group uh, that uh, that they've uh, they've uploaded and uh, imported into LabKey. Now they have a choice of making this data available to the rest of the group, continue processing it on their own. So that is the portion of LabKey. Um, Uh, so now that we've sort of went over the different components uh, and different databases that uh, are part of uh, brain code, uh, what really brings it all together and sort of the, the special sauce of uh, brain code is the federation system. The federation system allows us to integrate the data from these multiple data sources. So as you can see, what we've gone over already is all the different data sources that we currently have on brain code. Uh, Red, Red Cab, Open Clinical, like we talked about, Subject Registry, and LabKey. These are all independent databases that are providing the data management tools you require to collect your data. What we have implemented is a federation system using the IBM InfoSphere uh, Federation Server. And what happens is we actually take a snapshot of the data on a nightly basis. We clean and um, curate the data uh, to make it available uh, as summary uh, snapshots on a nightly basis. These summary snapshots are clean data that then uh, can be used to have integrated analyses done on, uh, on be uh, available for integrated analysis. And that data can be made available to uh, multiple um, different types of uh, programs within the analytical workspace, like uh, 
classes mentioned, as well as uh, enabling some of the visualization features that we're going to talk about next. Since the integration uh, layer is, uh, um, is sort of runs the background at the back end of uh, Okay, so there's, um, we still have a bit of background noise. If, uh, can everybody double check that they have their mute button on for their phone? Thank you. So since uh, the integration and the federation layer is uh, running on the back end, the best way to demonstrate the, the capacity it provides for Brango is using the dashboard that allows us to basically look at data across the different modalities that are coming from these different databases. So these dashboards currently we're uh, developing uh, with uh, collaboration with the different programs, and they really allow us to provide advanced real-time monitoring. Current use cases that we have are, are quite a bit around recruitment monitoring, site monitoring, whether data has been entered. Uh, we have uh, programs that are using it for quality control, like uh, Steve showed. Uh, for the data that's coming in, and as well as tracking participant parameter, parameters through the study, so how the, they are doing throughout the study and whether you're seeing improvements in certain scales or in certain parameters, uh, as well as uh, being used for data collection. So uh, we saw the upload delay, delay uh, dashboard, but also as well as what percentage of data is being uh, uploaded, is it being uploaded in a timely manner, and that applies to not only imaging, but as well as the clinical and the registry data as well. So just going to give you an example of uh, the uh, Andre uh, dashboard. Uh, uh, so these dashboards are pulling direct data directly from the databases. So and they're updated nightly. So. It allows you to really get uh, an accurate view of the data that is that is currently being collected uh, within the program. So the Andre dashboard is a great example of a monitoring dashboard that the uh, the uh, management team at Andre uh, is using to track their study. So again, going back to the Andre study design, you see that there's five disease themes and five disease areas uh, that they are monitoring. This first dashboard is an enrollment dashboard. So they were interested in knowing uh, where enrollment currently uh, stood. So uh, looking at the disease arms, you can select any of the disease arms, and these dashboards are very much responsive. So you can see that in the ADMCI group, uh, you have uh, patient, how many patients are currently at what visit. Uh, as they're advancing through the study, what sites uh, those patients are coming from, and how many patients are being re are currently enrolled at each of those sites. Now, this is very general uh, uh, enrollment uh, and tracking information. You can dive dive deeper uh, into uh, information that you require from the program. So, continuing on with the ADMCI you can have different parameters being displayed. So with AD MCI, you have two disease types, AD, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and MCI. You can actually see what is the split within that group. You can also have the, the sex distribution, uh, as well as the age ranges. Uh, some groups are also using it to track recruitment. So if you have uh, eligibility criteria, for example, a MOCA score requiring to be above or below a certain level, that can be implemented. An important thing to mention is that all of these parameters that you see are customizable. So depending on what your need is and what the scale uh, that you want to use, all of that can be uh, implemented on a dashboard the way that you, that you need. Like you see, for example, in the age ranges, we have a very granular uh, age range being displayed, whereas in another, pro another study, uh, the age range uh, may be uh, more dependent, uh, is, is required for uh, specific recruitment criteria, uh, and the age ranges can be adjusted accordingly for you to view um, what aspects, uh, what which, where your patient's uh, age ranges lie. Additionally, if you look at the bottom, this is where the integration is coming in. So, this is looking at the patients that are currently under the VCI cohort, you see how many have clinical records. How many of them actually have images that are currently uploaded to the registry, and how many uh, to the to spread, and how many actually have their uh, records 
uh, also uh, being recorded on the registry. And if you wanted to look at it by site, you can actually see the different sites and uh, how many records they have actually uploaded um, to the different uh, uh, databases. So that is just an example of uh, an enrollment and recruitment dashboard. Uh, these can be expanded into tracking uh, risk monitoring as well, which we have done for uh, a couple of other studies. And again, these are this is the collaborative process between us and the program, and we work very closely with uh, Peter and the uh, the uh, managers at uh, Andre to develop a customized dashboard for them. And, and uh, we look forward to sort of beginning to implement these uh, program and study dashboards for um, everybody, all the other IDPs as well. Great. Thank you, Mojit. So that completes the sort of demo uh, section uh, for the, the webinar. If anybody has any questions regarding some of the tools, um, we, can, we can take them now or we can maybe uh, have that, that Q&A a little bit after. Uh, there's a few things we, we did want to, to cover um, before we jump into the Q&A, and this is regarding more uh, with respect to, to, to the, the, the services that we provide, and it's not, and, you know, and this is really done through um, a team-based effort. So really, what we what we are we are switching gears in a way with BrainCode. We've been very much in the development phase over the, the initial uh, few years since about 2012. And we've really reached a point where this, uh, we have you know, on, ongoing data capture being done on the platform, which is excellent and we're really excited about. And um, we also have, uh, you know, the, the, the programs are also growing in terms of complexity and number of participants of recruiting, et cetera. So really what we want to do is, is really start to define a better way of providing services, uh, make it clear what we can support uh, from the perspective of the team here. Um, and also we'll, we'll go over some of the items that uh, we, we um, we, we do want to work with you, but that will have to be uh, covered by the programs themselves in terms of your, of your planning uh, moving forward with respect to uh, your data management and, uh, and, and data uh, analysis uh, for, the, for the studies that you, that you have. So I'll pass the hand to, to Brendan, who will just cover these, uh, these current, current services uh, that we're currently providing to the IDP. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Brendan from the informatics team here at the OBI. So I just quickly want to run through the uh, current services coach the IDPs. A lot of these have been covered in the uh, previous slides, but this is just a recap. So we provide training to all users on how to actually use the electronic data capture tools. And following training sessions, users actually get, um, they get test data in a test environment just to make sure that they are fully aware of how to use those tools. Point number two about troubleshooting, these tools also fits in with that. If users are having any problems with those tools or any issues, INDOC will work with them to help resolve them and rectify those problems. Number three is that INDOC will validate any electronic case report forms that you make. So the validation is just to ensure that those case report forms are correctly configured before they go into production. And that they need to be, if they need to be reconfigured, INDOC provides some guidance and support on such further development. Number four, in terms of account management, INDOC has a centralized system for managing accounts for access to the portal and the various data capture tools which, which have been previously uh, demoed. Number five, ethics tracking and support. We track all the consent forms that are associated with patient data coming onto the platform, so we're fully, aware what, we're fully aware of what data can be shared and what cannot be shared. And further to this, we also provide a standard generic consent language which you can use in your own consent forms to facilitate data upload and sharing on brain code. Number six refers to the basic data quality control that we provide. So we provide data quality assurance and um, we provide particular processes to ensure that we can give you a data package that is usable for analysis by researchers. And this applies to clinical imaging and molecular modalities. Number seven refers to the visual dashboard design. So we can create dashboards for your studies which demonstrate certain variables associated with the data. For example, the number of participants or the ages or the sites from which that data is coming from. And finally, number eight, we also have a capacity to offer uh, researchers an analysis workspaces at the Center for Advanced Computing in Kingston, Ontario. So this is a high performance computing platform which could definitely uh, facilitate researchers who want to run heavy duty analysis uh, work. 
So overall, these are the kind of eight major current services we are providing to IDPs at the moment. Great. Thank you, Brendan. Now, what we also want to, uh, to share with you is, is, is some of the, um, you know, the, the current things that we, we do not uh, provide and that we can't cover uh, based on, you know, limited resources and, and the fact that uh, quite a bit of this work uh, also has to come from the IDP. So we do want to work with you, however, in terms of planning this and helping you in that process of, uh, of capturing your data and managing that data. Um, so, but the first thing to keep in mind is, is on the data preparation side. Uh, it's definitely um, uh, some work that will have to be done on the IDP uh, in terms of at your, at your labs or in, within your institution in terms of being able to, to collect the data and also uh, prepare this data set for upload or, or for transfer to brain code. Uh, the second point here is uh, looking at, at case report form design and development. So we don't currently provide any support in-house in terms of designing um, these, uh, these case report forms. Um, uh, it's really it's really something that 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 has right now has been has been done by the uh, the either the coordinators or the research assistants or the, the investigators themselves in, uh, by based on the fact that they are the most familiar with their their study and their protocol. Uh, but we do have the staff um, and the team, especially on on the clinical side, will be uh, Anthony's team uh, supporting you in that that process of design. Um, and they, they will, however, be, be able to, to validate those case report forms once they're ready for production, as Brendan mentioned earlier. The third point here is entry and transfer. Uh, this is uh, sort of a, 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 standard, a standard process, and it, it, it's kind of straightforward that this would have to be done on the site. So we won't go into your labs, and we won't you know, go in, uh, and, and take your data and, and start transferring, transferring that data to brain code for you. Uh, so we do we do um, expect the IDPs to be able to plan on that on that front uh, in terms of allocating the right resources or finding the right staff that can essentially uh, prepare that data and, and either enter that data onto brain code or transfer that data on the platform. Um, the fourth point here is on additional QA and QC. So Brendan mentioned earlier we will provide um, a basic quality control and quality assurance of this data, whether it's clinical, imaging, or, or molecular. Uh, we are we are in the process of, of, of really finalizing that list and sharing that with the programs in terms of um, of rolling this out. Uh, but if you, you do have additional needs uh, from the perspective of quality control, quality assurance, if there are certain standards that you 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 prefer to adopt that are uh, specific to your to your uh, program or to your um, your modality, uh, then you'll have to plan for that and also uh, make sure you have the, the right the right folks uh, to to to, uh, to help you do this. Uh, we may have some tools that we could help you with uh, that are available on brain code, but if those tools are not available, those are things that you'll have to also uh, plan for. The fifth point here is on data, custom data extraction and releases. So we do plan on providing a, a, a sort of basic uh, release of your data and helping in that process of, of releasing data. But uh, when there are uh, additional needs and some, in some cases some fairly complex requirements, uh, based on certain combinations of, of variables or data sets, then uh, this is also something that, would you, that the programs should, uh, should plan for uh, from the perspective of either budgeting for and also um, uh, helping uh, uh, in the process of, of identifying what these, uh, these variables and, and, um, and what these data sets would look like. And finally, on the data analysis. So we are providing, as Brendan mentioned, the, um, the computing capacity uh, we're also providing the workspaces as well as some core software packages such as FAST. Um, we have R, Python, Spotfire instances. Um, we have a MATLAB production server that's available to run uh, some, some heavy-duty uh, MATLAB scripts. But when it comes to, um, to actually performing the analysis, uh, your teams should still plan to, uh, to identify the right individuals and also budget for perhaps additional licenses for software that are specific to your, to your modalities and your data types. Uh, we will, however, certainly work with you in helping you set up that, that workspace and that analysis uh, uh, pipeline um, if need be. So these are just things we want to emphasize in terms of, um, of understanding sort of where, the, you know, where, where do we draw a sort of boundary um, in terms of uh, the expectation on, on who, who can do what. Uh, but we do want to, to make it uh, clear that we are there to, to help you and, and you know, our, our phone lines and our emails are, are, are open to, uh, to receive any communication or any support that you need in, that pro in these processes. 
So this covers it on the services side. I hope that, that helps clarify maybe some questions. Um, we then want to jump into some of the, uh, the survey results. So we sent a survey uh, at, the, at the end of, of June uh, that was meant to really sort of help us g uh, gain a, a better understanding of what the, the current needs are from the programs uh, with respect to informatics and really understand how brain code could better, better help uh, from that perspective. So Brendan will help us, uh, I think, go through these, these uh, I think, the highlights of, this, of these survey results um, so that we, um, you know, we can share with you what, you know, the greater, the larger research community through the programs is, as, um, as, as um, I guess, ex expressed based on the survey. Brendan? Uh, thanks, Francis. As Francis said, I'll talk about some key findings from the survey, and perhaps this is a good segue into the Q&A at the end. Initially, we asked users in the survey, why do you use brain code? 75% responded saying they use brain code to store and manage study data. Around 50% said they use it to visualize their study data. And around 20% said they use it to share data. Uh, the other box was mostly filled of more details about file storage and the type of data capture tools people are using. What was notable here was how that 0% of respondents are actually using brain code to analyze data. And we feel like this potentially is a missed opportunity due to the amount of computational infrastructure we can offer to facilitate researchers. And we hope through this webinar we've reinforced that point, that there is this, these good resources the CEC available to researchers with software tools also there as well. So hopefully um, you know, we've, we can facilitate researchers on this front. So following this then, we asked researchers, do you find brain code useful? Luckily, <laughs> over 80% of users said yes, they do find it useful. Um, around 20% said no, and some of the points raised include that at the moment there isn't a single sign-on for its various data capture, tool, capture tools and brain code portal. And another uh, point raised was the current REDCap version we have isn't the most recent, and the most recent version currently has more, uh, more functions which could facilitate uh, research on that front. We then moved on to asking how uh, satisfied our brain code users with the services provided through the platform. So we had five services um, uh, you know, tested, uh, electronic data capture support, ECR validation, study ethics tracking and reporting, visual study dashboard design, and data QA and QC. And we asked users to score, well, to rate those different services on a scale from zero to five, with zero being unsatisfied and five being satisfied. So for electronic data capture support, the average was four out of five. For ECRF validation, the score was 3.2 out of 5, and one of the points raised on this front was whether it could be possible to implement an uh, ECRF ticketing system to try and get um, a better sense of a timeline of when it's going to be um, returned to the user. Uh, for study ethics tracking and reporting, a uh, score was 3 out of 5. For visual dashboard design, the average score was 3.4 out of 5, and one of the comments here was that they found the dashboard is sometimes slow to load once logged in, so maybe that's something we can investigate. And finally, for data QA and QC, the average score was four out of five. Um, and then a, a comment about that was whether it's possible to actually get a QC report by email rather than, rather than having to log in and go to the subject and session folders. Again, that's something we can, we can consider. Uh, another question we asked was, would you be interested in using um, workspaces and brain code for analysis? And around 80% said yes. So this is kind of in stark contrast to the very first slide I showed, where 0% of the people are actually using this facility right now, but around 80% are interested. So again, this is something we want to just reinforce that is available. Um, we also, in the survey, also stressed that software tools like SAS or Studio, MATLAB Server are also available through this workspace. And we also asked users what kind of other tools would they like to see in the workspace. And responses included SPSS, the stat software, and some newer imaging software packages like FSL and AFNI. Um, and again, we want to just state that if you wish to um, bring these software tools onto this workspace and have the appropriate licenses, this is possible. Um, related to this, we also asked a question about would the users be interested in working with data analysis experts? And I guess this is kind of timely as lots of IDPs move towards actually doing their first pass on um, data analysis. Roughly 80% said yes, they would be interested in working with data analysis experts to have a better probe and, you know, um, probe, better probe and investigate their data. So again, this is something we can try and facilitate by trying to put IDPs in contact with data analysis experts. 
Uh, we then asked users how satisfied are they with the data capture tools on Brain Code. Like before, the rating scale was from 0 to 5, 0 being unsatisfied, 5 being satisfied. And overall, that was also pretty good. For subject registry and REDCAP, the score was 4.5 out of 5. Uh, for Open Clinica, the average score was 3.5 out of 5. For spread on the XNAT framework, the average score was 3.83 out of 5. And finally, Lyme survey uh, was a bit below. It was a 1.6 out of 5. And one of the comments here was that the way Lyme survey had been set up for this particular group wasn't meeting their needs. So again, this is something we can investigate afterwards. And related to that, uh, we asked them how satisfied are they with the training speech tool? Again, the same scale, 0 to 5. And overall, it seems people were very satisfied with the training they're receiving from INDOC in terms of the actual training in person or, or, or online, but also the actual um, test data and test environment afterwards. Um, so above, in, in all different data capture tools, it was 4 or over out of 5. So that's a very good sign in terms of the training scheme seems to be very um, uh, you know, beneficial to researchers using the platform. Another question we asked was, uh, do you use the follow repository on Brain Code? 70% uh, said no, but in the remaining 30% who do, there were a few comments about ways to improve it. Uh, there were suggestions to try and make it faster. They find it a bit slow to load once they log in. Also, if it's possible to make the interface a bit easier to use. And one of the points was about how if someone wishes to download documents from the file repository, I don't believe well, this person said there isn't a facility to kind of package the files together. It must be done separately. So again, just, just some user interface issues we can try and um, cover later on. Okay. Um, and then next, we asked a question to users about how um, do they know how to use and access resources in brain code. And over around 55% said no, actually. They don't know that they're not fully aware of how to use and access resources on the platform. And uh, we asked some other questions about how better we can, you know, communicate resources to users. And around 90% said uh, regular emails could be beneficial. And also 80% said train, training videos and webinars would also facilitate, um, you know, their knowledge of resources and brain code. So this is something we will definitely consider, particularly maybe sending out regular emails to try and, um, you know, educate um, users on how, what, what new resources are available or at their disposal on the, disposal on the platform uh, moving forward. And the one final slide we, has, we had was, um, this is the final question in the survey. So would you recommend the Brain Code platform to other researchers? Again, uh, over 80% said yes, which is great to see. Um, for the around 15% who said no, um, some, of their points was, some of their points raised was about how to them there isn't full integration of all the different modality softwares yet. And another person raised the fact that BrainCode hasn't really reached its data sharing potential with third party researchers as of yet. Um, but I think as more data comes into the platform and we move forward with it, um, this, this will be something we can cover in future years, well, well as soon as possible. And um, in terms of recommendations about the platform, there was one person who said the security aspect of the platform was extremely um, you know, attractive to them and they would recommend it to the researchers based on that. And those are the major uh, findings from the survey, which I believe can then go into the, lead us into the Q&A session. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Excellent. So I think we've essentially covered everything we wanted to, uh, to share with uh, everyone today. Um, the Q&A session is now open. So if, there's, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. We have the team here to, to help you answer any of these questions. We have one question from the Lawson Research Group, and that's pertaining to the subject re registry. And um, the question is, do you know when we will get access to be able to enter OIT numbers? Sorry, do you? <coughs> Loss in, in loss in the research group team. So I guess they're, they're trying yeah. to gain access to the subject registry. So maybe the best, uh, if they're online, um, one, I think the, the best approach right now would be to probably reach out to your program manager to make sure that we do have accounts for you. Tom, is there any other process for the subject registry? Um, not, that we're, not as long as all the ethics approvals have been received, okay. um, then, then it's a very quick process. And a request has been made, yeah. 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 So there's maybe a bit of a follow-up there. Uh, but don't hesitate to send, uh, you can send me an email uh, uh, if you'd like to follow up on this. But if we had your name, we'll probably be able to, um, to, to follow up with you directly. So we'll make sure that we, we, we send you um, a follow-up email and maybe schedule a, a call or or ensure that we have the, the right process for, for uh, allowing you to gain access to the subject registry. But otherwise, as a, as a rule of thumb, for anybody who hasn't current, 
that um, who doesn't currently have an account on, on BrainCode for any of the tools, um, the, the right approach is to reach out to your program manager uh, for, your, for your own uh, integrated discovery program. And um, they will be able to then direct, uh, I mean, direct either the right individual or, 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 or follow the right process to essentially make a request for an account for you. Uh, so for the program managers, we do make available the uh, form for account requests, and um, they, they have support staff that helps in that process as well. Do you have any other questions? Uh, So are there any other questions on the, on the phone? If not, then uh, I think we've, uh, we've I think covered everything that, that we wanted to cover. Um, I think our plans moving forward are definitely to, like Brendan mentioned, is to um, increase sort of our, our opportunities to, to reach out to everybody, uh, both in the form of webinars, but also in the form of, um, of a newsletter or, or regular email updates. Uh, we're now working with the outreach team to see how we can set up a a sign-on on, on the BrainCode page so that uh, you, so investigators or anybody really outside can um, sign on and, and be informed of, of regular emails that we would send out. We're still going to work out that process and the frequency of those emails, um, but we're, we're definitely looking at uh, improving that, that bit of communication so that everybody can be aware of the latest updates on the platform uh, and also the services we provide as well as any, perhaps, um, any exciting news from the research perspective on, on, on recent outcomes that uh, some of the researchers might, might have um, uh, accomplished. So I think this is uh, our, our next stage moving forward from, from that perspective. So that being said, I think, thank you everybody for, for joining today. And uh, I also want to thank everybody, uh, part of uh, OBI and NDOC for, for, for the presentation. If you do have any further questions, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, we're available. There's a general email for anything that's technical. It's help at braincode.ca. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the folks at OBI, including uh, myself, Brendan, uh, Shannon, and everybody else are available uh, through email if you, if you have any other questions. So thank you very much, and um, I think we'll adjourn. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>